Hans Holbein, Henry's spin doctor, as I've called him. Now, spin doctor is a term that we read frequently in the newspapers and on television. We hear about spin doctors. Some are more famous than others. But it's, it's not entirely a complimentary expression anymore. It's people who massage lies to sound as if it's the truth. Henry is remembered, I think, for two reasons principally. One was everything that happened in his reign, in particular, a rather colourful reign. And the second is the genius of Hans Holbein, who left images of this man that persist to this day. But I'll offer you a definition of a spin doctor before I continue. A person whose job involves trying to control the way that someone is described to the public in order to influence what the public think about them. And generally today they're paid. And Holbein was no different. Now these are the three kings who preceded Henry VIII and the three monarchs who came afterwards. Now, knowing the U3A audience, there are probably a lot of people in the audience today who can name every one of them. But for certain, no matter where you showed this picture, the one that everyone would recognize would be Henry VIII. No question about it. And the runner-up would probably be Elizabeth I. So a lot of people nodding, so my analysis is right. And this is the image that did it for Henry. This is one of the most frequently quoted, described, and whatever. It's in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. And it was painted the year after Holbein was appointed court painter to Henry VIII. Henry was then 45 years old, already been 27 years at King, had changed the UK rather dramatically. This isn't by Holbein, Holbein, it's after Holbein, but almost certainly copied from a painting that Holbein did, now lost. It's originally painted in 1535 to 1536, as part of a very important dynastic picture that Henry wanted on the wall of his palace in Whitehall. And I'll show you something of that a little later. But this is the abiding image of Henry. It's a, he's strutting, he's facing directly at you, which is unusual for a portrait at the time, as you will see. And the really impressive thing about it is that it's life-size. So you walk into the Walker Art Gallery and it's bang, it's in your face. You can't miss this. I don't know who the little girl is, but that was the best image I could get of, of the size of it. But the mural was life-size as well, designed entirely to impress and overpower and to make sure that no one challenged this image of the king. This is a later one of him, just four years later. This is by Holbein. And again, this is a very familiar picture. And it's wonderfully ornate, it's wonderfully painted, and it's designed really to impress. I can say a few more things about this a little later on. So, who was Hans Holbein? He was born in Germany in 1497 in Augsburg, which was a free imperial city under the Holy Roman Empire. It's an university city. It's the third oldest, the third largest city in Bavaria, after Munich and Nuremberg. It's Germany's third oldest city. But it's very tricky to find out which is the first and second. I've spent some time. Tier is one, Worms might be another. But anyway, most reference books say this one's third. Founded by the Romans. It's also the only German city with its own legal holiday. And it's called the Friedenfest. And it is. It's on August the 8th. So if you want a really good day out with lots of beer, August the 8th in Augsburg is the day to choose. Now Holbein's father, after Holbein the Younger, this guy became Holbein the Elder, painted this altarpiece in 1504. He was not only a religious painter, he was a portraitist, he designed stained glass, he was a goldsmith, Wonderfully clever chap. 
Now, Hans Holbein the Younger is claimed by Germany as German. He was born there, after all. He did leave when he was 18. He's claimed by the Swiss because he spent seven or eight years in two different stints in Switzerland. And in the UK, you can find art critics referring him to him as our Hans Holbein, the painter of Henry VIII. So, success as many fathers, as we all know. Now, this particular painting is very interesting for at least one other reason, which is if you look in the bottom corner there, can you see this red dot? Well, that's it in detail. This is Hans Holbein the Elder. This is Hans Holbein the Younger. And this is his brother, Ambrosius. So he's, he's, he's put the nippers and himself in the picture. He drew them some years later. And Ambrosius became a painter too, but he died about 1519 and not much is known about him. But it's a, it's a lovely likeness. There's a, there's a tenderness about drawing your own children, I think. And it's in this picture. Anyway, when he was 18, Holbein moved to Baal in Switzerland. Baal was the centre of the European printing industry. It was the European capital of books. That's how it was described. And he was apprenticed to the best printer in Baal, Johannes Froben. And he was apprenticed as an illustrator. He worked there for about 10 years, travelled to Italy and France, and that, that influenced his development as a painter. He got married to a tanner's widow. Now, she was from Baal. That gave him some tax advantages. I'm not saying that's why he did it. There's, there's no reference to Panama in this at all. But because he married a lady from Baal, he became a burger, a free burger of Baal, where otherwise he would have had to pay for the privilege. Anyway, he, tra he travelled around, he entered the Painters' Comp Corporation, and within two years was a leading member of that, and within another two years he was painting important mur murals for the Great Council Chamber in Baal. So he was really very quickly making a name for himself as a man on the move. This, this was painted some time later, when Holbein was 25, but it's the best Holbein remaining of Froben. And again, that's a lovely picture. It's signed and dated. It's, it's all there, unquestionably, by the man. And it's one of the beautiful pictures that I'll be talking about that are in the Royal Collection. There's a Latin inscription on the ledge, which you can't make, quite make out, but it identifies Froben and it identifies Holbein as the painter. Now, this man is fantastically important in Holbein's life. Froben printed Erasmus's books. Erasmus was the humanist of his time, probably the most famous celebrity in Europe at the time. He was the first editor of the New Testament. He was a very important writer in classical literature and patristics, which, as you all know, is the study of early Christian writers. He was one of the most respected thinkers of his day and as well known as, and as connected as you could possibly be. His works include countless quotes, of which this is one, that all of us use his expressions and, and most of us use them without knowing that he was the originator of these. One of his greatest works was The Praise of Folly. And that was written when he was a guest at the home of Thomas More in England, and he dedicated it to Thomas More. And Thomas More pops up, he becomes a very important character in Holbein's life. And it was in the margins of In Praise of Folly, in Erasmus's own copy, his own first edition, that Erasmus allowed Holbein to draw these sketches. Now, some of the sketches, he's only 18, by the way, when he's doing this. He's only just met Erasmus. Erasmus has only just seen the work that he's capable of doing. And he gives him his first edition and lets him draw in the margins. 
now some of the drawings are quite bawdy and uh, happily I've not been able to find them on the internet so I'm <laughs> avoiding embarrassment for all of us. But he's just arrived from Germany and in no time he's impressed Europe's premier thinker. The praise of folly poked fun at just about everything, every norm of behaviour at the time. And Erasmus clearly enjoyed having Holbein joined in. There's no evidence that he discouraged him in any way. Quite the opposite. He thought he was such a precocious talent, I think, that he gave him a great deal of sponsorship and encouragement. This is the first commercial work that Holbein produced. And it's an advertisement for a school teacher, for a schoolmaster. We know when it was done. No question about the date, 1516. And just remember that for a minute when you look at the next picture I'm going to show you. And these are the, these are the, this is the headmaster, I think. There he is. And you've got this. And, and how many of us have seen that pose? You're talking to someone and you're sort of leaning across, getting involved. It's fantastically lively. I think, and they are clearly enjoying what they're doing. It's very well constructed, there's good perspective, it's animated, and it's a terrific advertisement. So it's one thing to paint someone, but it's quite another thing to paint an advertisement that promotes something else. And this is perhaps his first attempt at being a spin doctor. He's trying to sell the idea of your children coming to this place. This is a good man to come to be taught by. This is the place to come. It's a very interesting, I think, picture. Because it's quite different to the next painting I'm going to show you, painted in the same year, but for a different purpose. Now, you would not think, I did anyway, that this was painted by the same chap who painted the previous two little pictures. This is a classic dual portrait, as good as anything you'll see anywhere. What wonderful picture. Uh, this is Jacob Meyer, who's an up-and-coming man in Baal, and he continues to improve his position in life, as I'll show you in a while. His wife looks a little pensive, but it's classic piece of portrait painting. And one of the things that will become apparent as we go th through the talk is that the, the more important you are, the more of you gets painted. Right? Head and shoulders, head and shoulders and a bit more, more important and so on, until you get to Henry, which is the full frontal. That's the lot, that's the big man. Now, we don't know how much he was paid for, for any of his portraits, really, other than the amount of money he was paid by Henry. But this is, the, this is his road to classic portraiture. Some lovely details around here. And you'll see this in a lot of his paintings. He pay, pays a great deal of attention to the background and he uses the background to convey a message about the people in the portrait. And he uses their clothes, painting their clothes and the jewellery. You know, this, is, this is about, I'm on the up. We're a, we're a smart pair. And this one's the same. This is a, this is a Bali yuppie. 1517, I think. And, and this one's unusual because he's staring directly at you. This is one of the few portraits, apart from Henry, where it's not in profile. But this is really, he's engaging you, the viewer. I'm, I'm, I'm important. I'm a smart lad. Now, this is thought to be Holbein's wife, uh, the, the Tanner's widow. We don't know her age. She's, she's thought to be a couple of years older than Holbein. Uh, but this is a wonderfully gentle picture. Really, there's, a, there's affection in this picture, I think. And there's another painting of her a little later on that I'll show you. Now, this is more of a classic portrait. This, is, uh, he's a, this man's a scholar. And there's, a, there's something German about this, there's something French about it, there's something Italian about it in the way that it was done. The inscription is important, that tells you a lot. He's not looking at us, this is this sort of stern, I'm a serious man, but I'm important enough to be painted. 
Holbein was also busy in designing woodcuts for, uh, for title pages of books, because remember he'd been hired as, a, as an illustrator. And he did some of the illustrations for the first German translation of the New Testament by Martin Luther. And Martin Luther plays an important part in Holbein's life also. I'm not sure I should use the word favorite for a picture like this, but this is, this is my favorite Holbein picture. It's claustrophobic. It's just taken the side panel off the coffin. <coughs> oh, pardon me. And you can see the body shows signs of corruption, especially around this. You see the blackening of the hands, the blackening of the feet. Looks uninjured otherwise. And curiously, his eyes are open and his mouth is a little open. And it's life size. Although Holbein was born a Catholic, as were most people at that time, uh, his most impressive religious works, the brilliant observations of physical reality, you could believe that that's what he saw and that's what he painted. But there's not much of an air of spirituality about his religious painting. He paints what he sees and he paints it very, very well. And his classic, there's, there's, I don't think there's anything about spirituality or religion in this. He's painting what he thinks is in the coffin. And you'll see that in some other works of his as well. The few religious paintings I'm going to show you, they are wonderful observations of something. But they don't have you thinking, well, maybe there is something bigger than this. But it's a wonderful picture. Now, he did... Uh, he was asked to create an image of Martin Luther. This is his representation of, of Martin Luther. Um, he's showing him as the Greek god Hercules, and he's attacking people who are the non-believers. In amongst the bodies here are Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. Others, they, he's bludgeoned them to death. The German inquisitor Hoogstraten, this chap is about to get walloped with this spiky club. I mean, it's a serious way to knock somebody over. Uh, suspended from a ring in Luther's nose here is uh, a little figure of the Pope, Leo X. Now, this is a very clever picture because if you were a follower of Luther, you could see Luther as the man destroying the her heretics and anybody else, all the non-believers. And they could, they could say, oh, that's terrific. Classical scholars saw it a little differently. They thought they saw a champion of falsehood over power and over medieval error. And papists saw Leo X's description of Luther as an uncouth beast. So depending on your angle, you could say, God, you're absolutely right, man's, a, man's hideous. So it was a clever picture because you could see it from different points of view. And you could say that Holbein was just hedging his bets, really. And there's still some evidence later on in his painting that he's not certain that even though he's converted or seen the light and become Protestant, that somewhere in the back of his mind is, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Perhaps I'll just stay Catholic in reserve and I'll hedge my bets and I can't be attacked for my paintings because they're capable of being interpreted in multiple ways. This was Holbein's first portrait of Erasmus. He does, does another one. And again, this is a man sort of detached from the world. He's a serious thinker. His trade is, is words. This is a, typical of the time, very elaborate. The, uh, this, this glass vessel here indicates the fragility of life, the fragility of time. Erasmus is a pure man. It's all about truth. You can't hide anything behind clear glass. So there's symbolism in all of these. But this is, this is a man of words and a serious thinker. And this is called Darmstadt Madonna. And this is Jacob Meyer. Remember him from Holbein's first double portrait of Meyer and his wife? Classically painted, classic style. 
mayor is now the burgomaster of Baal, so he's really come on in the world. And there's no doubt that he'd have, paid, he'd have paid for this picture to be commissioned with him and his wife in it. It's got late German medieval format about the painting. It's got Italian treatment of the form. Jacob and his wife would have loved this. You know, I'm the man who's arrived, and look at us. We're around the Madonna. And there's some very clever work in this. The, the faces are beautiful. See, look at, look at this. Uh, there's nothing but he's just adoring, isn't he? She's thinking about things. What's brilliant about this picture as well, though, is this, painting this foreshortening of the arm. Graham, am I right? This is a tricky thing to paint. Very hard indeed. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. Yeah. So th th this is a chap, but he's only, well, when was this painted? 1526. So he's, he's 29 producing work like this. But his time in Switzerland has come to an end. He travels to London in 1526. He's armed with a letter of introduction from Erasmus, who'd met Thomas More. And if you remember, he'd stayed at Thomas More's house when he was writing in Brains of Folly. So there was probably no better introduction to England than Thomas More at the time, armed with a letter of introduction from Erasmus. More was said to be one of the few people impressed with Holbein as a painter, because in December 1526, Moore wrote to Erasmus saying, your painter is a wonderful artist, but I fear he is not likely to find England so fertile as I had hoped, and as he had hoped. Yet I will do my best to see that he does not find it absolutely barren. And so what does he do? He arranges for Holbein to paint the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Not a bad first stopping point. And interestingly, this gate here is referred to as the Holbein Gate, but there's no connection because it was there a long time before Holbein appeared on the scene. And this was the painting he did of the Archbishop. Now what a careworn face. He was, uh, he was very important as an intermediary between Henry and the papacy, and he's portrayed here in his papal chapel He's surrounded by luxury and money and power. Everything is a man, but look at this face. What a contrast. Man with the cares of the world on his shoulder. And England is entering tumultuous times. And this guy is going to be in the eye of the storm. And here's Thomas More himself. Now this picture is regularly judged in poles and all sorts of things, as one of the hundred best pictures in the world. Uh, the Frick Collection have got four of Holbein's pictures. And reference works about Thomas More interesting, they describe his occupation as a philosopher, a journalist, a lawyer, and a saint. I didn't know that was a paid occupation. But this is a powerfully penetrating photograph of the second most powerful man in the country at the time that this was painted. And this is Thomas More and his family. Now there's a couple of things about this picture that are interesting. It's painted by Roland Lockie after Holbein. It's felt that Holbein painted it originally, but the original was lost, probably in a fire. They lost a lot of pictures through fire. But it was copied from Holbein, and I'll explain a little later on why these copies are, are so good. But this was the first, the important thing about it, this was the first family group painting in history. And it's his extended family, they're all named in the record. Moore's wife, one of these two, I'm not sure which one, was originally painted by Holbein kneeling. And Thomas More said, absolutely not. The only time my wife kneels is in church. She's in the family home, so he's painted her on a stool. So you can imagine that that was the process he paints away. And, and the chap who's commissioned it says, ah, uh, 
take that freckle out if you would, and, by the way. But it's, it's the first group painting in history. But all good things have to come to an end, principally for tax reasons. If he stayed away from Baal for more than two years, then he lost his citizenship. So he had to go back. Interesting though, he's made enough money while he's been in England to buy a second property in Baal. So he's already bought the first and he's gone back with some loot and he's, he's buying another one. And what a picture, this is his wife and his children. Now, what a likeness to him when he was 11 years old. But what a sad, you know, she's been on her, on her own in Baal for two years while he's been away. And it, it's probably the only psychologically penetrating portrait that he ever painted. And it does convey some unhappiness, I think. But he was quickly back into, uh, into the flow in Baal. He was re-engaged by the town council and was very busy on their behalf. But Baal wasn't a good place to be either a Catholic or an artist at the time because of this chap. Martin Luther had come along and the effect of his preaching ruined the market for all kinds of, me of religious art. So he really wiped it out. There was a severe recession in the art world. <coughs> Interestingly though, this guy's not modest. He had 70 portraits of himself painted in his time. These are by Lucas Cranach, and this is the room in the house in which he translated the New Testament into German, and it contains the first edition of, of that translation. And this is him when he's a little older, and a little podgier, and probably a little wealthier. Erasmus, though, helped out Holbein by commissioning another portrait of himself. And he's just, he's just aged a little bit. He's got the book. Not so much in the background. But again, it's a, it's a beautifully penetrating portrait. And he also produced, while he was, the, probably the last of his religious paintings. And this was an attempt to express Lutheran ideas in a reformed religious art. But he's still hedging his bets. And the cognoscenti would say, well, there's a nod to Catholicism here and there's a nod to Protestantism over there and whatever. He's tried to put this together. And this one's in Scotland, so it's not difficult to go see that one. But business is business. It was time to leave Switzerland again. And he returned to England in 1532 without his family and stayed alone in England for the rest of his life. Now, religious painting was out of favour in England anyway. In England, it was all about self, money, wealth, ancestry, power. Portraits, portraits, portraits of the rich and powerful designed to impress. You think of any stately home you've ever visited, National Trust is full of these things. And so in modern parlance, he followed the money. Uh, this is just one staircase in Chatsworth. But this is, this is all about, look how important and powerful we are. You don't, you don't see much by way of religious painting. And there was, when he followed the money, there was plenty of it. Still true today. This man is a city trader, German, member of the Hanseatic League, League which was founded in London about 200 years earlier. You can think of it as a sort of German Hong Kong in London, on the banks of the Thames, Steel Yard it was called. It was a tax-free zone. And this chap was one of the traders who operated there. So it's, a again, a classic portrait. He's looking at us. He's, he's, I'm important. Look at me, I'm looking at you. He's surrounded by the tools of his trade. Many things right on the edge of the, uh, of the table, the glass. Life is fragile. That could fall off at any time. The money could tip topple at any time. 
So it's a really interesting portrait of the man, but it tells you a lot also about what he does. Life is precarious, that's what this is all about. And England was not a settled place when this was painted, for, especially for those close to the throne. Henry was prone to, let's do this, let's do that. Not a good time to be around. So just staying alive if you were in court was tough enough. And these are two of the great schemers at this court. This is one of Holbein's most famous pictures. And it's the, uh, the French ambassador. And this chap, 25 year old, he's ambassador to the Vatican and uh, a few other things. And they're, they're both in London and they're both plotting. And as with the Arnolfini portrait, there's an industry around this picture and the significance of everything. I'm only going to touch on a few of those things. But, but Holbein frequently, as you've seen with his portraits, put some context around them to explain what was important about this man. But the, one of the oddest things about this picture is this image here, which I'm sure you will all know. But a, a game that he was playing. And it was designed not to be seen from the front, this, this part of the picture. The picture was placed on a wall, like so, and the door to the room in which it was kept was here. So when you walked through the door and looked at it, looked at that close up, what you saw was that. So from this angle, looking at the picture, that's what you see. And then as you come around, it morphs back into that as part of that. So it, no one's certain about this, whether he was simply showing off or whether again it was, it's a skull, we all return to bone and dust. No matter how much you scheme, that's where you're going to end up. And the top shelf is laden with things all to do with time. So life is, you know, doesn't last. The clock is ticking for us all the time. Some of these things are right on the edge of the tablecloth again. Can fall off at any time. So these are the, inst the time instruments of the day. All designed to say, don't bank on being here for a long time. You're all going to go. And on the lower shelf is, but on the other hand, while you're here, enjoy yourself. Music, but there's a broken string on the lute. What's gone wrong might be the question about this bit. The, um, this shows two hymns, but research has shown that in the addition of this hymnal, these two hymns are not on opposite pages. So Holbein has put them on opposite pages for a reason. And again, it's loaded with symbolism. And the final bit of symbolism in it is in the top left-hand corner of the picture is a crucifix. So th these two are Catholics. He's a Protestant. It's painted in Protestant England. And the, again, is he, is he just hedging his bets here? I'll put this in just in case the world changes and we become Catholic again and I can say, uh -uh, I was on the right side. Look at the top left-hand corner of my picture. Now, the most powerful schema at the time is Cromwell, master of destruction and the creator of British bureaucracy. So the tools of his trade, pen and paper, and he established bureaucracy at the center of government. And this portrait brought, of Cromwell brought Holbein terrific recognition at court. This is a miniature that was painted about the same time, and they think that was painted to decorate a, a chest or a, or a casket or something, but, but very suitable for an important man. You might have had a coat of arms on your, on your sea chest, but if you're Cromwell, you want your picture. Holbein was probably introduced to Anne by Thomas More. I think she was a, she was a niece. It was formally attributed to Holbein, currently it's not. 
in 10 years' time, it might be again. Who knows? But it's a, it's a beautiful drawing, either way. Now, not only did he paint, but he designed. He was a goldsmith, goldsmith designer. And some of the pieces he designed, I'll show you now. Uh, Anne Boleyn gave Henry this. And it's got her, her crest on it. So he was a sort of fashion designer to the court. And for the royal court alone, he created designs for Henry's state robes. And he left more than 250 drawings of buttons, buckles, horse outfittings, all sorts of regalia, pendants, brooches, and a huge catalogue of stuff that he, that he designed. And I suppose this is quite handy because if you can have multiple queens, you get multiple presents. And this is, the, uh, this is Holbein's first image of Henry. It's quite small. It's on vellum in ink, watercolour, pure silver and pure gold. But what a pose. <laughs> now you could, you could say, well, that's a cheeky thing for the new painter to be doing. He's not yet official court painter to Henry. But you could say, well, that's, that's pretty bold for, to paint Henry like that. But clearly, Henry saw more than the joke. And this is, well, who are you lot? Again, I'm looking directly at you. Don't you dare challenge me. I can do what I like. It was the following year he was appointed court painter at £30 per annum. Now, you might like to guess what that would be worth today. Hands up if you think it's as much as half a million. More than half a million. Oh, only one, thank you. It's around £700,000 per annum. Henry wanted to be the best dressed monarch in Europe. He pays Holbein four times what he paints his tailor. But not, funnily enough, more than his existing court painter, who we'll come to a little later. But it's reckoned in the last ten years of his life, Holbein painted about 150 portraits of the nobility and royalty in England. But it, that's a cracker, I think. I'm sure the Queen goes along and looks at that and thinks, gosh, why can't I do that? <laughs> now, he paints Margaret Moore in 1535. Now, Thomas More is in trouble at this point. So it's a brave man, not only to depict Henry the way that he has, but to paint More's daughter when More is under something of a cloud at this point. Moore was in really quite a bit of a pickle. Uh, but it doesn't stop Holbein. This is a man comfortable, as we'd say today, in his own skin, probably in his own oil paint. And then this is Henry's big project. This is the first English Bible. It was Henry's elite project. He decided he wanted to do this, and he was going to publish it. And he wanted Holbein, who had started life as a woodcutter and an illustrator, remember, to, predict, to do the cover. It shows Henry on the throne, just down here. And he's in charge. This is Henry's view of being a king. I'm on the front page. I can do what I want. I'm the man. I'm the man to meddle with. And this is one of the two or three really famous pictures. Very expensively dressed. He wanted to be the best dressed monarch in Europe, and by crikey he was. And I'll, I'll have to read out a few things from this, because I don't want to get this wrong. At this point, Henry wanted to change his image. He, he'd beaten the Pope, and he decided to transform himself into the Reformation patriarch. I am now the head of the Reformed Church, and I want an image to match. Cromwell organised a propaganda campaign and his objectives to his spin doctor were to create an image of royalty so powerful that it should compel the loyalty formerly reserved for the more ancient power of Rome. And his, Cromwell's masterstroke was to realise how Holbein could communicate these new concepts in paint. And, to, and it's Holbein's vision of Henry 
that we all remember today, ruthless, domineering, I'm in charge. It's only A4 in size, it's only that big. But it's wonderfully detailed. There's real gold in it, there's real silver. It's very intricate. And he set the standard, really, to the extent that the printed page superseded public spectacle. You, you, could, you could joust all day long, but the number of people going to see it was small. You get your image out. And he, his ambassadors were sent abroad with this. He autographed some of them. If you were really important and you turned up at court, you might go away with an autographed copy. So it's clear propaganda. And before this point, tapestry was the most important. What was at the top? That was the apex of artistic value. They die after this point. Painting and portraiture takes over. Now this is probably a preliminary sketch for a painting that I referred to earlier, the Whitehall mural, where he was doing some drawings. And again, this is just a chalk drawing. But, and people were said to fear looking directly even at his pictures. He, was such a, he had such a reputation. Clearly, Holbein's got no qualms at being stared at and painting him and expressing what he sees. But this is as beautiful a drawing as you'd see of anyone. I think it's almost photographic. And the cartoon, this is a cartoon for the mural. This is one of the preliminary sketches. This is the left-hand side of the cartoon. I'll show you the whole thing in a minute. The mural was completed in 1537, and this is a preparatory drawing, or called a cartoon at the time, for the left-hand section of the picture. The painting itself was destroyed in a fire. Uh, one of the maids left some, left some ironing drying in front of the fire. The thing caught up, and up it went. Happily, he'd arranged for a copy to be taken beforehand. It's three-quarters face in this one. He's looking to one side. And it's full length. So this is the hierarchy at work again. The only paintings we've seen full length are of the, are of the top dog. In the finished version, he's looking directly at, at us. And the pic, this picture is huge. This is eight feet by four feet. And it's a copy made at the time that he did the original, did the mural. And it's true to the lost original because it shows this rucked up carpet on the side. And when you see the mural, you'll see there's the stage in the centre. Because it would make no sense if it was just a portrait by itself. There'd be no reason for it to be there. And this is really, I dare you to look at me. I don't need to wear a crown. I am the king. I'm in charge. And you better tremble when you walk in front of this. He did apparently, though, have rather a large codpiece. So that might be another bit of advertising, who knows. <laughs> and Queen Jane. Two Holbeins here. Quite different styles, grey background and some shadow, black background, different outfit. But he's, he's painting the royal family now. He's still designing pieces, some more presents coming his way. Uh, every time he got a new queen, he got some more presents. And there's no evidence that he chucked the others away. And this was the copy of the White Hall mural. So this is full size, life size, uh, painted in 1537. And Henry wanted it. To, this is dynastic. This is the Tudor dynasty that's ruling this country. Occupied an entire wall in the palace. He's shown you with the, his queen, Jane Seymour, and his, and his father, Henry VII, and his, and his mother, Elizabeth of York. The palace burned down in 1698, as I've said, but this copy was made earlier. And this was said to make men tremble as they walked past it. They didn't want to look at it because that was too much, too much to take. And the inscription, I'd read it all to you in Latin if my eyesight was good enough, and my Latin. But what it says is that Henry VII was great. But Henry VIII is greater. And the chances are that Jane was, was dead 
by the time this picture was finished. But because Holbein had painted her previously, he knew exactly what she looked like. She didn't need to pose. And these two had been painted as well, so they... And there she is from the earlier portrait. So Jane Seymour dies, so what do you need? He needs another wife. And there's no Facebook, there's no dating app, or anything like that, so he sends Holbein across to Europe to paint the prospective candidates. And uh, this is Christina of Denmark. She's already a widow. She's only 16. But she had the good sense to turn him down. And the only document that talks about how Holbein painted mentions that he took notes and made sketches for about three hours, just three hours, and then went back with all his detailed notes to produce the picture. And the, this is, shows a mastery of playing with black. I don't know how many shades of black are in this, and lovely contrast with her pale skin. Anyway, she turned him down, but Henry kept the picture. This was the lovely or unlovely Anne of Cleves, depending on your reading of history. The mayor of Flanders, she's frequently described as, but the people who were around at the time said she was actually quite an attractive lady. She managed, she was the one who managed to get out of the marriage with her head still on her, on her, on her neck. So you can see that she was the one who got away. The Duchess of Milan didn't join in, she joined in, but she managed to escape. Cromwell, who'd pushed for the marriage to uh, Anne of Cleves, eventually lost his head, and this was said to be one of the reasons. But Holbein wasn't blamed for this, even though a lot of historians have said, oh, you know, Holbein carried the can for that, you know, because it wasn't a true representation, she wasn't as pretty as he made out, and so on. But that's not supported by the evidence, because the next picture that Holbein painted was of Henry's son. And that's a lovely little picture again, chubby little man, with his rattle in the style of the royal scepter. And the, uh, the inscription says, however, that no matter how good he turns out, he can't surpass his father. So we know that Henry VIII now has established himself well as a modest man. <laughs> Another of the schemers. Oh, you see, the, this, half of him is in. Half of him is in the painting. Now, he was one of the most powerful nobles in the country, uncle to Anne Boleyn and to Catherine Howard, godfather to Prince Edward, and he'd married his daughter Mary to Henry's illegitimate son. However, the son and he were involved in a bit of scheming. The son was executed. He was tossed into prison. But he escaped execution because... The day before he was due to be executed, Henry died. However, he stayed in prison for another six years and then Mary released him. It's a three quarters, three quarters on and a three quarter portrait and he's got all the regalia of the Order of the Garter and the Knight of this and the Lord of the Sink Ports and all the rest of it. Uh, and it, the, the Venetian ambassador said that with, with all of the finery, it shows him as a rather more imposing presence than he is. He was described as small and spare by the Venetian ambassador, but Holbein has puffed him up to something important. You've got to influence the way that people see you. See you. Anne of Cleves was divorced. And two weeks later, on the very day Cromwell was executed, Henry marries Catherine Howard. And she's the last of Henry's queens to be painted by Holbein. But again, it's a beautifully drawn picture. Another painting that he did for her. Now, historians have been able to identify only one portrait of her. That's definitely of Catherine Howard. And dispute has raged as to who this might be. But most experts say, given the quality of the jewellery and the finery of the clothes, it couldn't be anyone other than Catherine Howard. However, she lost her head in 1542, so it matters not. And this one is life-size. And again, this is often mistakenly attributed to Holbein. 
But whatever, Holbein's portraits set the standard. And people, there was an industry around copying Holbein's portraits and Holbein's style of painting, because that's what sold. So the other artists were following the money as well. So most of Henry's portraits are either by Holbein or they're Holbein-esque. It's clearly derived from the Whitehall mural portrait. And he's, again, he's looking us straight in the eye. He's got his hand on the sword. He's holding a glove, the jewellery, everything about it. He's the best dressed king in the world, really. And to stray for a moment into the world of high art. <laughs> He's even on Miss Piggy's art masterpiece calendar. And as I found out since I talked about the Arnolfini portrait, the Arnolfini portrait is in the calendar as well. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. So how much more influence would you want a spin doctor to have, eh? Now, I put this in because uh, this is a, a, a lovely drawing, but it, dis it enables us to describe how he worked. And when you look at the Holbein picture, or an after Holbein, you find, if you held one up against the light and one behind it, the correspondence is almost perfect. Which leads people to believe that what happened was the original portrait, or the original sketch, was, was laid over a sheet which might have had graphite on it or chalk, and with pinpricks, they marked around to a piece of paper or something underneath the outline and the detail, which then went away to be painted. And that's how they got the correspondence. It was like filling in a sandwich between two pieces. And because his detailed notes existed of what, what cloth, what jewelry, what design, what colors, you could produce a very Holbein-esque, a really good imitation or copy of a work by him. And, and this is the sort of thing that would have been produced that way. And again, no one knows who painted this one, but again, this is part of, part of the factory, let's produce Henry pictures. It's all about the clothes he's wearing, the jewelry, how expensive it all is. This was produced during his marriage to Catherine Howard. And there's an almost identical version of this at Cambridge University which suggests that these things were being produced in substantial numbers. And why there's such a problem of attribution today? How do you tell them apart? Now, this was something I clipped out of the Times uh, just before Christmas. This had been found in an attic or something, a bit like the Caravaggio that was found in an attic in France the day before yesterday. This was purchased for a pound in the 19th century and is expected to sell for over a million at auction. Some experts believe it is by Holbein and they're still arguing over it and it will clearly affect the price at auction when it is sorted. A German art historian who saw this picture in 1835 said, there is in these features a brutal egotism, an obstinacy and a harshness of feeling such I have never yet seen in a human countenance. In the eyes, too, there's the suspicious watchfulness of a wild beast, so that I became quite uncomfortable from looking at it. For the picture, a masterpiece of Holbein's, is as true in the smallest details as if the king himself was standing in front of you. Hundreds of years later. And this is the man. I think he's the only outstanding German artist of his generation. There was no outstanding English artist at the time, no serious competition. And historians suggest that his direct gaze suggested he was looking in a mirror and he was painting himself from the reflection in the mirror. This is probably the last picture that Holbein produced. And it, Edward is six years old in this. He's He's lost his chubbiness, but he's a, he's a king to be. And this is probably the last painting he did of Henry. This is 10 foot by 6 foot. It's one of the largest that he did. 
Henry's on the throne. Here's the, uh, the head of the barber surgeons. Henry's not looking at anybody other than, he's, not, he's just looking at us. And he's wearing a crown, an, uh, unusual for him. And he's handing something over to the master of the barber surgeons, but he's not looking at him. He's looking at you. And he's just handing this piece of paper to somebody else. Various other members of the guild are around. They're all named. Presumably they paid to be in the picture. That wouldn't be unusual. But it's not the complete picture. The left-hand side was damaged in, a in the Great Fire of London. <coughs> and it was only saved by being moved to the Anatomy Theatre nearby. And there is a Welsh connection here. This was saved from the bombing in 1940 by having been moved to the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. So we did our bit. <laughs> this is the last image of Holbein. And it's, this, is, this is very heavily disputed amongst the experts. It's attributed to Lucas Horenboot, who was painter to the king at the time that Henry was appointed, that Holbein was appointed painter to the king, and he was the man paid more than Holbein. Now, some people think this is by Holbein. Some people think that uh, Horenboot copied it from a painting, from a self-portrait that Holbein had done. And make your, I'm going to offer you the chance to make up your own mind about this. I, this is a quality picture. You've, this is the sort of style we've been seeing for the last hour or so, not quite. And these are two other works by Horan Boot. And there are poles apart, poles apart, I think. So I'm, I'm with some of the experts on this. I think this was either copied from Holbein or painted by Holbein. Anyway, sadly, in 1543, Holbein died. He was only 45 reportedly of the plague. He was working on another portrait of Henry at the time, but his friends were at his bedside when he died, so the plague therefore seems unlikely. And he described himself in his will as servant to his king's majesty. He'd made his will on the 7th of October at his own home in Aldgate in London. John of Antwerp, a goldsmith, and some of his friends were with him, and some German neighbours witnessed, signed as witnesses, the death certificate. We don't know where his grave is, but his legacy remains. Part of the legacy was a sad wife and children in Bar. And, and a man who could paint such compassion in a painting like this, and such arrogance in a painting like this one. They're as different as chalk and cheese, these two. And you think of uh, Christ in the tomb. You know, the, the emotional range of this painter is phenomenal. His legacy lived on at the time. After Holbein died, Henry commissioned a painting in the style of Holbein. Specifically, that was the instruction. I want this to look as if Holbein had done it. Another important dynastic work. Here's the king with Mary and Elizabeth I. This is the court jester. It's painted in the, the, the background is Whitehall Palace, the gardens of Whitehall Palace. So this is Prince Edward and Jane Seymour. This is Mary, this is Elizabeth. We don't know who the artist is, but you could, you'd look at that and you'd think, oh yes, it's a Holbein. And that's what Henry wanted. Some people think it's Nicolas de Vaunt. Some think it was a British painter. We don't know. They're still arguing about it. So what I've shown you is a collection of pictures from galleries in Europe and America. I've only talked about paintings in these places. But think of a world-class gallery and they've either got a Holbein or they'd like to have one. I've shown about 50 this afternoon and about 200 are still known to exist. So he left his mark, you know, the most recognizable monarch probably in history. Massive, domineering, I'm in charge, don't you dare challenge me, and people didn't. 
And that image is perpetuated by just about everyone who writes about Henry today. Whether it's on a book cover, or it's a television dramatization, Wolf Hall and all that, or the Tudors, doesn't matter, it's Holbein's work that is this, that's the image that they want, that's the one that people recognize. So, if the job of a spin doctor is to influence the way people see you, or the way you want, the way that you want people to see you, I think he succeeded. And thank you for listening. Jeff has been a wonderful member, and I consider him to be a good friend. So I want you to join me now in thanking Jeff for another excellent presentation, which has been historic. Yeah. <laughs>